Uh, I will uh, introduce, well, I, I haven't uploaded this yet, but I'll uh, introduce the uh, assignment. Uh, it's, a, it's a draft. Okay, so I, I will upload it uh, towards the end of the week. Uh, but I wanted to uh, let you know what it is, because that's, main, that's the main part of the subject anyway. So, uh, I'm not, this, this is quite a nice problem, so I, I'm not uh, going to change much of, this, of the problem. So this is a solar chimney, have you heard of solar chimneys? A solar chimney is a device, so uh, this, it, it's a device of this shape, it's a really large one, really tall one, so now this can, this can go up to about 50 meters or so. So what, what we try to get is the buoyancy effect of the, of the air, and uh, <coughs> then uh, this, so this is kind of transparent, semi-transparent, so, uh, and that, that's, that's your flow. So that's the cross-section of the apparatus, in a sense, uh, the, the structure, in a sense. Um, so what happens is the air gets heated here, and uh, when, when it is heated, it, it goes up, it goes up through the tunnel uh, due to the chimney, due to buoyancy. And uh, so then you have a turbine running uh, in here, normally here, because that is where you get the highest velocity. Even though you might think, okay, you have to place it here, but you don't have to because it's the same air that is going from there to there anyway. It's the same air, air, air volume. So, um, and uh, yeah, so, it, and the pressure here could be lower anyway, the pressure difference could be, yeah. so you get losses here. So that is the place where you place the turbine, so. Um, this is what we are going to um, simulate in your uh, CFD problem. So uh, you can add radiation and so on. So uh, initially you do a 2D problem, 2D uh, simulation, and then you, you try to do a 3D simulation as well. So 3D simulation can be tricky. Uh, so th that's, that's your problem. Fairly, um, that's fairly a clear cut problem. But uh, then, then you will have uh, different uh, problems that arise in CFD. How to simulate <coughs> this? Thing. So, think about this. So, this is this is just to um, introduce the problem to you. So, this is quite the, the the geometry is not that difficult. It's not very easy either. But it's it's not that difficult uh, uh, in a sense. So, two D geometry is fairly um, easy. And uh, some people have done this before, in a sense. So, uh, so you got uh, some dimensions there. So, these curvatures, etc. You need to. Uh, this is all you've got. So, uh, some you, you have to fill some gaps there as well. So, um, get the measurements, get the curvatures, and and uh, you have some little bit of. Uh, leeway in a sense, you, you can decide for yourself as well. So you get the basic parameters, so curvatures, etc. you can decide a little bit. Uh, so, uh, the first task is to do an axisymmetric problem, and the second task is to do a 3D uh, problem, and then uh, then you can compare your findings with. Uh, there is a paper uh, given uh, as well, so uh, by by previous uh, researchers, so you can compare your results with uh, what is published on this topic. Yes, so that's the. Um, so that, that's, that's the paper, yes. uh, Risto uh, versus uh, Wilkowski. So you, you, you might find that you have done a, 
I mean, if you spend a lot of time, you might, you might find that you have done a better job than the original paper with your understanding of the problem. Okay. So, because the original paper was done some time ago. Um, what, what are the findings that we're supposed to be finding out, like the velocity of the air and yeah, the air? Yeah, so basically what you are trying to find is the energy that can be uh, generated so, through the turbine. So, so that is basically air velocity. So once you put the air velocity, you know. Um, and turbines like a standard number. Yeah, you, you don't have to design the turbine per second, so you don't need what you need to get is the uh, air flow rate basically through the through the neck. When you when you get that, you, you know how much you can generate with that yeah. using the turbine. Yeah. And is that the we can barricades? Yeah, and, and you can um, <coughs> you can uh, compare the temperatures as well because temperature has a has an has an effect because the total energy is the kinetic energy plus the thermal energy phase. So, uh, Uh, again, uh, you, you you need it. It's a it's a it, uh, so you have to write a paper basically. So uh, eight page, uh, uh, not more than ten ten A4 pages. Uh, so uh, it it has to be written just like the paper. Yeah. So it's not a report or anything. If you are writing it as a paper with an abstract and introduction and so on. So, um, so these are the suggested uh, titles uh, for the sub sections. So, you, you can add or add more or I wouldn't suggest deleting, but you can, you can add, add more. And uh, make sure you get the right graphs to um, show your results and so on. So, again, mesh study and things like that are they are basic stuff that you you may not want it in the paper itself. So once and, and I have given some other references. How, how much is the word count? How much? Sir? How much is the word count? How much is the word the count? There is there is no word count per se. Okay. Two two and a half thousand is the okay. it's just a page count Yeah. Okay. So you might write more than because on average it will be about 400 yeah. words per page or 400 to 500 words mm -hmm. per page but with the graphs if it is 50 percent uh, graphs so it will, it will come down to about two and a half thousand mm -hmm. so, so I'm not strict on that but 10 pages yes I'm kind of strict on that like eight, yeah. You will find that you will, you need all the ten pages to do everything. <laughs> um, in the references, you want the bibliography as well as. Yeah. But that doesn't count the pages. No. And uh, so I have already given like four references there. So you will find like twenty thirty for twenty references on for, on this one. This is a. Eight week exercises, so you will be doing this until uh, <coughs> middle mid mid April. <laughs> In the tutorial, we're supposed to work on that. Or yeah, you you manage your own time, so yeah. But it's kind of like in the previous module, was actually yeah. Yeah, but uh, you're not in the previous class, so I I have some uh, I have a set of fairly elaborate tutorials which you can do in like. How many did you do last time? One tutorial? Yeah. Only yeah. one was available. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I told us. I, I, you, you went through the... Um, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that as well. Um, yeah, on that 
can you make all of them available? I, I, I thought I had made, made all of them available anyway. We'll, we'll see. Uh, can someone go into your blackboard, please? They're, they're, they're on, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, 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 uh, in, in learning materials, you, you don't, it's not in the lecture itself. It's in yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's different. It's added more since last session. Yeah, tutorials. So then you go to access tutorials and then all the tutorials are there for you to refer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the idea. I, I wouldn't release all the lectures at once, but tutorials, you can do it on your own face, yeah. It's okay that you spend only one, uh, you do only one tutorial on the first day, so that's the normal pace. So th then you pick up, you might do two, two tutorials on a day afterwards. So. You, you might need like three, four days to do the, do the tutorials. And by the side, you can do your assignment as well. So, um, we can start the lecture. So we are going to talk about meshing today. Uh, so uh, you can interrupt me and ask questions when you have questions okay? as normal. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, what is actually meshing, why do we mesh and the methods of meshing and we'll uh, talk about the distinction between uh, structured and unstructured, unstructured meshes uh, and how to treat uh, the boundary, boundary layer um, and some examples. So you must have, you have done this before but uh, we'll um, talk about it in uh, a little more detail. So if you've done computational methods you, you, you know what we are talking about. Uh, so. So um, meshing is generally to replace a solid geometry model uh, with a set of discrete uh, points, lines, panels or, or, or elements. So it could be points, lines, panels, and it's, a, it's a 2D one or, or elements. Elements, it's a 3D element, yes, usually. Um, so um, we say it's, it's a method to cut uh, whole flow domain uh, into small elements. So, uh, so if you take a loaf of bread, you slice it and then you can cut it. So that's basically what you're doing. Um, and uh, those uh, elements could be 1D, one-dimensional, two-dimensional or three-dimensional. So 1D uh, elements are so uh, segments of a line basically. So you have a line and you have segments of the line, so that those are 1D elements. Then you have a 2D elements could be generally triangular or square, but you can also have more elaborated shapes in 2D, but you don't. Uh, it's not necessary so, uh, because uh, triangular or, or quad elements are sufficient, they are more structured, especially quad elements. They are structured, therefore um, uh, easy to uh, deal with. Yeah, so uh, there is no um, gain if you go uh, for a hex element in a 2D structure. You can do it, but no point. It's like a, it will look like a honeycomb, and it doesn't do much of a purpose. Um, and then uh, in 3D. Well, then you can have a multi-hedral elements, if you, if you want to say that. Uh, so, tets or hex uh, or prisms or 
or elements like that. So that depends on the 3D structure really. So the, uh, your domain. So uh, anyway, what you are going, what you are trying to do is you have to have continuous elements in a line, in a 2D surface or in a 3D structure. So it has to be continuous, meaning there can't be any gaps, any gaps at all. Okay? So one element should be adjacent, adjacent to the next element all the time. Okay? If there are gaps, there is a problem. Okay? So you can't have gaps. Remember that you can't have gaps at all. Um, <coughs> so why do we need a mesh? So a computer is a digital system. So it stores uh, numbers or data uh, in, in a binary structure. So that means uh, 0 and uh, 1. Okay. So uh, therefore anything that is stored in a computer has to be um, stored uh, in, a, in a binary structure. That means uh, your element or line or uh, tetrahedral real element or anything like that, it has to be stored as a set of zeros and ones. Okay. So, so it comes down to zeros and ones. So, um, and uh, when you simulate, when you do a, when you do a CFD uh, or, or a simulation, so, um, so you, what you are doing is you are doing a virtual modeling and you, uh, that is called a prototyping. Or you can do virtual testing, um, so you can have a virtual wind tunnel and compare it with an actual wind tunnel uh, data. And uh, then you can uh, do flow physics, uh, so that is to look at the conservation law uh, in, in discretized form. And uh, then uh, finally you can do uh, visualization, so you, you look at the results that you've uh, obtained uh, from your um, computational tool. And uh, where do you start? How to start meshing? So, uh, so you, you start with a clear geometry. So, um, I was talking about uh, cat cleaning. Um, so, for example, if you get the uh, drawing of, uh, of this film, you you will get a cat drawing. So, if you look at a cat drawing of this building, or say this room, uh, you will get a lot of unnecessary data in that drawing. <coughs> Excuse me. For for example, you you will get the wall thicknesses, and you will get the ceiling thicknesses. Um, and so on. Do you need that for your CFD or, or not? Why not? Because you only model the flow, not the pipe. You only model the flow. You only model the air volume inside this uh, space. So, any wall thicknesses, anything beyond that wall surface, you have to discard. So, you want to make sure that your drawing only includes the boundaries of the uh, fluid volume. So that is what you are, what you call uh, cat cleaning, meaning you get rid of all the unnecessary data and get a clean drawing of the air volume. Do you actually alter the cat though, or do you just do the inverse volume thing? Um, what you what you can do is uh, now you can't do it with usually you can't do it with auto cat. Auto, auto cat and so on. They, they are not real 3D software, even though they are 3D software. They are not really 3D software, but SolidWorks is. Uh, and uh, then you have to get a clean line going from that software. So that uh, you, you can have different, you can have like uh, common uh, platforms like. Uh, there are different file types. So, for example, a cat file cannot be sometimes uh, using uh, ANSYS. 
So we need to know uh, what, the, what the bio types uh, that can be read from uh, ANSYS. And uh, as I said earlier, so there are some software that would uh, that would help you to clean uh, any type of growing and fill the holes and uh, make the lines continuous, etc. And give so you can use a an intermediate software to do the cleaning process, so, or, or to generate a nice growing in that uh, software itself. So a software like Rhino can be used for that. You can also use the uh, you, you can actually use um, the drawing tools uh, in uh, ANSYS to do that as well. So, for, for example, now uh, Space Plane has a lot of facilities. Uh, uh, it, because if you haven't used Space Plane, I know that uh, if you, even if you did your, uh, if, even if you used, uh, if, even if you did uh, computational methods, you wouldn't have used Space Plane. Have you? you I've used it. No, not, not for that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, space claim is a, a space claim claim can be used to, to do a lot of uh, capturing, a lot of like cat cleaning actually, or generate uh, drawings as well. So, um, you must have seen uh, the tutorials that the tutorial that I have used put uh, for you to do a small space space claim problem. So, try that. It, it 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 will be useful for you. So you can use your space claim to generate the um, geometry for your assignment. Uh, then also you can use uh, uh, just dimensions. So you can uh, use the uh, old drawing board method where you have dimensions, you get the dimensions, give the dimensions, the software in a 2D structure and generate your drawing. You can do that, so that's a neat way of doing it, um, for, especially for 2D cases, uh, you, can, you, can, you can just uh, draw on, on a sketch board. In, in the sense on the computer you can give dimensions and, and do the line segments and so on and curves and so on. Uh, <coughs> then depending on uh, the shape you need to decide the uh, mesh type whether you want to go te uh, text or prisms or depending on whether it's 2D or 3D. So if it is 2D as I said uh, it should be triangles or squares. If it is uh, 3D, you want, again you want to know whether it's going to be um, tech or hex. Hex are structured, very structured, and they? Because if these are cubes, one after the other. So, uh, but uh, that is only, that will only be useful if the, if your volume is kind of a box. If your volume is not a, it doesn't have a square, square shape you cannot do uh, a structured mesh. And uh, then you um, need to decide the distribution as well. That means uh, you need, if you are solving a flow field, you need to know whether, you need to know whether there are a lot of things happening in a certain part of the flow field or not. So if you, if you have a, if you have a lot of physics, happening in, in a certain part of the flow field, you need to have a lot of elements in there to resolve the flow field properly. So you need to uh, understand the physics inside. You need to have a, you need to, you need to guess it as well. Yeah, or in a sense, so you, you need to have an understanding of the, of the physics of the flow. Yeah, so when you, when you look at some, so for example, okay, we are going to, uh, Simulate the air, air flow inside this uh, room. Okay, then you need to look at the inlets and outlets. Okay, and the walls. And uh, where do you where do you want more 
read notes in this in the blog room. Where? <laughs> One is a bomb player and then while you're in nuts and outlets. In your at your inlets and outlets. Yes, so, so those are the main places where, where you want to resolve the flow field properly. And uh, if you take this, this, if you don't have anything near this space, you can have a very large element. But at the inlet and the outlet and at the, rock, at the boundaries, you need to resolve it better. So um, that is be so. You gave me that answer because you have an understanding of the general physics. Yes. So that's that's where you start. And uh, then, um, so, first, second and third points you understand. So, you can have line element, a 2D uh, element or a 3D element. Yeah. So, then uh, the next one is what I'm going to um, describe now. So, where do you keep your variables? So, this, what, what I'm asking is now, we, we, we talked about elements line element or um, a square element or a triangular element but that element has uh, physical properties yes so velocities and so on and uh, where do we keep the records so for example if you take a square so where, where, where do you keep so how do you define the velocity at the edges, nodes or at the center? It's the node, isn't it? Sorry? It's the node, isn't it? You can do both. Yeah. You can have the values for all nodes or you can have a central value for all the central value for that element. So that's 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 why I'm asking the question. So you can have the values at nodes or you can have the values at the center. The value at the center is the average of the nodes. Yeah, value at the center is the average. But still, if you have a fine enough grid, so you, those 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 values are good enough to show the uh, show what is happening in the domain itself. Good question. Think about this. Yeah, when you when you when you look at when you resolve when you go and um, resolve a problem in the, in the software, see where it is, see, where, see what it shows you. Usually, it's in the node center. It shows you the very fast. And uh, you know this basically. Uh, so so you have three um, coordinate systems: Cartesian. Cylindrical or spherical. Uh, so these are two. These are these are polar coordinates. So that is the Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, and uh, if you classify uh, the uh, meshes, you have uh, structured meshes like two uh, D meshes, uh, or you can use. Uh, partial differential equation methods or algebraic techniques to have a structure, structured meshes. Yes. So a structured mesh is not just a mesh that has uh, elements of the same size. Okay. In a structured mesh you can have elements of different sizes. But uh, the relationship between the between one element and the next element, there should be a relationship. So you, could, you can have a multiplication factor uh, or, or so, but it, it still can be a st uh, structured element. Uh, and then uh, for, for um, <coughs> unstructured meshes, so you can have different uh, techniques uh, for delayed One is, they, these are some names as well, uh, delayed triangulation, uh, advancing front, uh, octree method, etc. So 
there's a um, read about this uh, so these, these different techniques right? so um, some of these are available in the um, ANSYS uh, not the tutorial but the um, user diary so I, I put that upon, put that on the a blackboard as well so I can get from the 800 page document We'll, we'll generally use structured meshes, but what's the benefits of the three? I know there's different options, but when, why, why would you use chopped? What's the? So uh, the, the first three are talking about. Yeah, as, as I said, like uh, for example, if you have a say you you are we are resolving the flow field, yes, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's your inlet and that's your outlet, let's say, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so, for example, if you have a uh, small inlet here and uh, just a wide outlet, where do you want your grid resolution to be fine? In here, yes. mm -hmm. there you don't need that need a fine grid resolution. So then, what you would do is you, you will have a very fine resolution here, and then you have a multiplication factor so that the grid nodes are becoming larger to a thin. But do all three of those structured meshes do that? If so, what's the difference between the three that are on there? Now these, these are di different techniques to use uh, 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 those uh, differences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one, one can have an advantage over the other. So uh, what I've just described is the algebraic method so you can have a multiplication factor, okay. or you can have a partial differential equation uh, to have this relationship between the first node and the second node, yeah. and so on. And uh, then you can have hybrid meshes as well. So that means uh, in a certain area, you have a structured structure. So uh, if it is very, um, if, if it is very complex, you really want to have a structured structure, structure so that you can uh, get the answers easier. But then, if you are not concerned about uh, a middle area in the middle of, 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 for example, in this volume set per se, you have an unstructured, uh, un unstructured grid so that because the uh, the advantage of using an unstructured mesh could be that you will not have the same number of elements as a structured mesh. By doing that, you, uh, you your problem size becomes slightly smaller. That means it will take less memory in the computer. That means your the resolution time will be slightly faster, and you will get the same result as a structured mesh most of the time. Yeah. Because we're approaching this without any experience of those unstructured meshes, we have to prove from. Do you expect us to do a comparison when we are yeah. doing the report or do we just write at the end that maybe there's an unstructured mesh that's going to be more suitable but for the same uh, what I more like you to do is to try it too and uh, see whether it works or it doesn't work for you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, you're just jumping into the problem now, but you will have some time to test your problem as well. So, start with a structure that works, yeah. right, where you can solve the problem. Then you can try your uh, different options. And uh, I don't, well, if you, if you test a lot of things, I, I don't want you to put everything in the report itself in an appendix, or you can just show me in a uh, biostructure somewhere else and just let me know that you have tested this. Yes.
<coughs> we talked about this uh, roughly yeah, last time as well. So, um, um, so FEA versus CFD. Somebody asked whether you you, you want do I include FD, FEA in this uh, module as well? No, we are only talking about CFD. Okay, so uh, it's just for for comparison purposes that I put a, an FEA thing here. FDA structure. Um, now, this is a, say, for, for example, the airflow around a formula car. And uh, say, this, uh, this example could be a wind tunnel test or CFD. Uh, it is regarded as a digital wind tunnel in a, in a sense. Now, now we have come to that stage where you can uh, you can uh, simulate it properly uh, using CFD. Now, this wasn't possible like 20 years ago uh, because uh, of the computer power. But now we have a uh, fairly good computer power so that you can uh, get good results using this. Um, I remember um, uh, some time ago, um, they, the Formula student, box, sorry, not Formula student, they, the Formula One teams, they used to hire wind tunnels uh, or they would bring their wind tunnels to universities and then they would do their winter testing, winter wind tunnel testing. They still do that, but they, they do a lot of testing on computers these days. So they, they, they still still do winter testing, but they don't do everything in the winter. So uh, there was a time when they did most of the thing in the winter itself. So uh, during uh, the winter, they would hire, they, they would come to universities because uh, uh, you can you can do it. Uh, you you have the know-how and the personnel as well as the secrecy too because uh, um, universities uh, are places where you can do um, you can do testing without infringing uh, any laws and things like that So uh, the data for the elements or data for the uh, structure or the drawing uh, can be given as coordinate points uh, blue or machine drawings or CAD files. So these are the inputs that you can coordinate, coordinates or blueprint, blueprint mechanical drawings or uh, CAD files. <coughs> so that is, that is how you get the problem. Then you have to translate that problem into a uh, volume. Well, a mesh basically. Yes. So you need to have an understanding of how, how to do that. Um, one, uh, so I will elaborate on this. So if you got the coordinate points, easy. Yes. So you can put the coordinate points in the in the uh, meshing tool, and you can just give the uh, dimensions of the domain. But uh, when you get a drawing, how do you do that? You can even use a PDF. Yes. So, you, so you, you have the PDF, then you can uh, scale the drawing, and then you can draw on, on the PDF. Taking the PDF as a reference, you can generate the drawing. Yes. Generate your, your domain. CAD file, you know, you just import the CAD file, and then you do the CAD cleaning process, and then you define the domain. The domain. So this is a an example. So that so that 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 could be a small uh, element. So uh, you you need to uh, define when, when you define a geometry, uh, you need to look at 
where your in inlets and outlets are as well. So, for example, uh, uh, there are no Aero students here. So, Aero students used to do uh, this uh, uh, Aero foil problem. So, you can have a squarish domain or you can have a domain that has a kind of a curvy uh, inlet and a curvy outlet as well. So, you reduce the number of red, red nodes. But when you have that, you, you, you need to know whether your inlet, your how, how to define the inlet. So if it is a straight inlet, it's difficult to have a, a, no velocity is normal to that boundary. Okay. But if you have a curved inlet, so if you have velocity is normal to that boundary, you, so you, you, are, you are not defining the velocity properly, the direction. So, in other words, what you, what you are saying is constructing the flow domain uh, usually requires sketching out the topology of the grid. So, you need once you have got, once you have got the domain, you need to know how you construct your grid. Yes. So then, then, if it is a square, no problem. So, you, if, it is a, if it is a square grid, first thing that will come to mind is okay, I will have a structure. Uh, hex, uh, hex, hex grid or a um, square grid like if it is 2D but uh, if it is if it is a complex shape what you would think first is okay I will have to go for hex I will have to go for prisms or triangles yeah, so that uh, and uh, usually problems have an inlet from one side and out outlet from one from another side so uh, make sure that you, when you have an inlet, your your elements at the inlet have a surface normal to that to the velocity velocity that are coming in or going out. So you, that that how say this is your domain. If that is your inlet and if that is your outlet. Make sure that the grid nodes here, or the elements here, they face the incoming, the, the inlet uh, normal to the velocity. Okay. Uh, not like uh, at, a, at, a, at an acute angle. Okay. So uh, make sure that outlet is, if, it, if you can do that, it's nice. If you can't, Again, avoid really acute angles at the outlet, so because uh, it's not going to uh, do any good, but it, it, it will complicate, complicate your problem most of the time. So, uh, but on the other hand, sometimes it will be very difficult to uh, have a structured grid on compact shapes. So you, you, you don't have. So in that case, you you can have you can use an unstructured grid so that prisms will uh, populate your domain. That's my domain. Yeah. yeah. So in a structured grid, I will have say ten grid nodes in that along that line. Yeah. And I have ten grid, the same ten nodes along that line as well. So that will be a square. Mm -hmm. So that's structured. So in the three in, in uh, all three different directions, you have a certain number of grid nodes and that number remains a constant. If it is unstructured, then have a triangle here. Another triangle, another triangle, another triangle and so on. So this is this will be populated by triangles. And the number of triangles that are along this line is not equal to the number of triangles that are along this line. So that's that's unstructured. So the previous one was structured.
So, uh, as a, so the answer to your question is written just there as well. So, a structured mesh can be recognized by all interior nodes of the mesh having an equal number of adjacent elements. Yes. So, you have an equal number of adjacent elements in all three directions. Yes. That's, uh, and uh, in unstructured grid, it's not the same. Okay. So, you can have any number. So, uh, uh, again, you have a, there, there are some. Um, there is an overlap between the unstructured and unstructured mesh generation techniques, uh, but uh, there are <coughs> smoothing algorithms and uh, iterative algorithms that are being used as well. So uh, this is a, these are two examples uh, of a structured and an unstructured grid. So. Uh, So these are all actually structured grids. So trying to have the same number of grid nodes in all, th all three or two directions. Yes. So these are uh, structured grids. Uh, these are unstructured grids. Okay. So because you can have any number of elements at the. Uh, yeah. So now if you take the number of elements there and number of elements here, they are different, aren't they? So, and uh, in this one, you have the same number of grid nodes along that line and you have, they have the same number of grid nodes along this line. Yeah. And that's your <coughs> inlet, that you could be outlet. So, you have the same number of grid lines here as the number of grid lines here. Yeah. So, that's it. It's a so, if you use the wrong type of mesh, so if you use the wrong type, like structure, You did a small grid independence study and, and see whether you get alarmingly different results. But the, the rule of thumb is if you get a if you get a fine grid and it, if it runs, you will normally get a get an acceptable result. But most of the time when you when you use a, a structured grid sometimes it will not run. You, in, a, in a complex geometry, it may not run. Uh, it's, it, it will be normal. Normally, it is easier to use an unstructured grid and make the problem run. But your result will not be as good as a result from a structured grid. Because a structured grid sometimes, it, most of the time, will give you a better result, better resolution. Uh, but uh, try to use the rule of thumb that you you have uh, uh, when you have inlets or outlets, make sure your grid nodes are normal to the inlet and outlet. So that will that will solve a lot of problems. Really. If it is a structured one, and it depends on the domain. Yeah. So um, it's good to have a lot of elements at the inlet as well as outlet. But sometimes you have pressure outlets, which are like large openings. Then you can have a coarse grid at that side, but at the inlet you always need a fine grid because you have a high velocity gradients at the inlet. So, you need to have a rough understanding of the flow field before you go into the problem. Uh, but 
then uh, you can uh, cluster. Now, this is a hybrid grid where you have a uh, grid clustering. So you you are trying to uh, solve the boundary layer here, and then you you don't you are not much worried about here. Then. Uh, <coughs> Then you uh, look at the boundary layer thickness uh, and you talk about y plus as well. And uh, in fluent you have what you call the inflation layer function. Inflation layer is a layer uh, that you uh, use near a, near a boundary layer so that you have a higher number of grids there. Then you can do what you call grid stretching. Grid stretching means you start with a small distance between the first two nodes and then a slightly larger uh, distance between the next and so that you, you, you have a stretching factor which will stretch the grid when you go to when you go along a line or a coordinate uh, axis. And uh, when you stretch grids uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, use 1.1 1 .1 to 1 1.2. So those are the best. Okay. Don't go beyond 1.2 unless um, your unless it is unless you can afford to have a very coarse mesh. 1.1 is uh, if you if you can use 1.1, that will be very good actually. But uh, using 1.1 means that you will have to have a large number of grid nodes. Okay. Is this just the tool in ANSYS? Yeah. Is there examples in the tutorials and stuff? Should be. There's, there's an example in, in, uh, in your first, uh, in, in your second year tutorials as a grid section. You used it, but you didn't. You might not have recognized what that the function. Okay. Orthogonality, orthogonality means uh, orthogonal means uh, normal to one another. So, uh, if if your grid lines are orthogonal, that that will be very good. So that is what I, that's what I why I said you you can't have like really acute angles. If you have really acute angles, it won't. Uh, it won't, it, it, it won't give you good results so uh, for grid, for elements yes so um, if you have an angle less than 45 that 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 won't give you a good uh, result normally so the and in cfx you can go up to about 30 uh, but uh, that is you are stretching yourself a little bit too much. And there are different grid generation tools. So uh, you can also you can use AutoCAD, SolidWorks and CoEngineer etc. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so I ISEM and SpaceClaim are the ones that I used in Fluent. Uh, and, uh, These are all names for gen different grid generation tools. Yes. So, um, uh, coarse grid can be generated using space claim. Now, um, the standard now uh, is to have your gen have your geometry generated initially is space claim now in uh, ANSYS. Okay. okay. So uh, that concludes. Uh, uh, discussion about meshing. Uh, so, to resolve a flow problem, meshing is the is the key. So you have to have a good mesh. If you have a good mesh, you, your half the problem is solved. Yes, uh, and uh, it requires about 40, 50 percent of the total time. You need your experience and you need practice. So do a so with tutorial one and two you can do a, a mesh study as well. And thank you for listening. We are just about time, and. Uh
I'll see you in the tutorial class uh, if you have problems and uh, see you next week for the lecture.